Shalom. Welcome to the Bread of Life International Ministries YouTube channel. We are honored that you chose to share with us today. Please remember to subscribe to our channel and share this channel with family and friends. We would also like to ask you to take a look at our schedule for the services that we do offer. We have a teleconference where you are able to dial in and share with us wherever you are. Thank you so much for being a partner with Bread of Life International Ministries. On behalf of my husband and myself, we thank God for you. And may your life shine brightly in Jesus' mighty name. Have a blessed and wonderful day. God bless you. We are going to study the word of the Lord tonight. So grab your Bibles, your highlighters, your pens, your pencils, your paper, your, your iPad, your notepad, your, whatever it is you have, whatever it is that you do, uh, just don't get distracted. Don't allow social media to come into this time. Turn off the television. Shut everything off and just allow your mind to be right now soaked with the blood of Jesus and the word of God. And I just want to say uh, my husband reminded me that I had been giving uh, us each a word each month. And so um, I wanted to just share and reiterate that in January we started with the word fear. That was what the Holy Spirit gave us to deal with. And there were some mighty messages that the Lord had given us to counteract and to deal with the spirit of fear. And I want to say just because we leave a month and we leave that word, it doesn't mean that you can't still have um fellowship with God and, and looking in the, in the scriptures to find more scriptures that will actually strengthen us so we don't have to revert back to fear, because fear can be in our foundation, and it can want to stop us from moving forward. And then in February, we went from fear to abide, and we talked about how that we were, uh, in John 15, how God said that we abide in him and, our, and his word abide in us, whatever we ask. It shall be done. And then from February, we went into March, and March was the miracle month. That was the month of miracles. We talked about the fact that God had given us a prophetic word many years ago about the month of March being so much of a miracle. But then we also talked about how Turin was the time when God would turn our stories upside down. And so as that time progressed, and, and March in, March came in, we began to see March and April, uh, how they both were just connected as miracle months with resurrection being in April, Passover, and all of that. And then we, um, we're now in May. And I want to give you the word for this month. I heard the Lord very clearly. And I'm telling you, it was almost like Isaiah 65 and 24, where he says, before they will ask, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. It was just like that. And the word for the month of May is steadfastness, steadfastness. And what that means is it's the quality of being resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering, steadfastness, the quality of being resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. That's so powerful to me when I heard that. The Lord is looking for those of us to be steadfast, to have to be uh, uh, to be placed in a position of steadfastness, to be absolute, to be resolute, to be dutiful, to not unwa- to be unwavering. Don't let anything get you out of rhythm with God. Don't let anything pull you out of serving Him and and coming after Him. Don't 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 just get up an answer to a prayer and then go south. Don't don't have don't let trials beat you down so badly that you don't even think God is real. No, God wants us to be unwavering. So let me just give you some um, synonyms of that that word to be sure, dependable. You know, people in this day and age, we got to be able to trust. Uh, uh, that you know you're you're you know you'll be where you say you will be, or you'll do what you say you would do, or you know you'll come. You know if we prepare a good meal in the natural, and we invite people to come and eat, and they don't come, you feel like, well, man, that's a waste. Well, just like with the spiritual, if you prepare a good word for the you know by the Holy Spirit, or if God just gives you a prophetic word, but there is nobody here to receive it, or nobody, which I still go on with God, and it does, it won't stop me. But the point is. It's for souls. It's for people to hear. And so we want you to be steadfast and to be dependable and reliable, to be constant, to be unwavering, to be steadfast, to be staunch, to be steady, to 
imply a sureness and a continuousness that may be depended upon. People of God, that's who we are. That's what we want to be. We want to be able to be those people that are literally fixed in place, that even if the wind is blowing, even if life is, is really, you know, bringing some challenges, whether or not things are good or whether or not things are like I want them to be, I'm going to serve the Lord and love him. That's what we have to determine in our hearts. So the word for this month, the month of May, is steadfastness. And I want you to challenge yourself to get your Bibles and begin to look at the concordance, the, 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 you know, the back of the Bible, and see how many scriptures you can find with the word steadfast or steadfastness or dependable or whatever the case may be, and just maybe two or three scriptures for yourself, and just begin to meditate on those scriptures because God wants us to be consistent and continuous in what it is that we are doing. So it's also to indicate, wait, wait, people are going to hold on one second. I'm in Bible study. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. That, I, I thought this was an emergency. That was my, my sister, so I apologize. I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. But all right, so now here we are. Um, that word for me is steadfastness or steadfast, and we want to be able to find scriptures that will help us to really grasp the concept. But tonight I have a special word for us. And I, I, have, I have two words, actually. I have two. And so I brought both of them with me and asking the Lord to choose which one he would want me to actually share. So as I began to, you know, just uh, worship the Lord and, and, and just exhort, you know, and do exhortation, uh, he began to speak on one of the words more than the other. So I'm going to start with what I think he wants to do. And if in the, in the midstream, he says something differently, then we will have to change. But for now, we're going to begin to look at this word because I think that, you know, we have been talking about witchcraft and we have been talking about things that I know it may be new to some. You may not have really, you know, heard it from this perspective, but know that I have great, great lessons that are already planned and put, uh, prepared for you and I to actually grow in that area because we're living in a time, and I just want to say this, we're living in a time where it's waxing evil and more evil every day. It's living, we're living in a time where things are changing so drastically and so rapidly before our eyes that we have to become people that are able to protect ourselves by being prayerful, by doing warfare prayers by being discerning, by having discernment, by being able to sense that something isn't right in the area where you are and begin to take authority and dominion over that area. So I'm not at all leaving that task. I certainly have messages that the Lord wants us to go there, but I think it's, in, it's important to, to balance what we learn. And so I want to also encourage you all that this, this Saturday, coming up this Saturday, we have our prayer power hour. And I'm telling you, people of God, if you want to grow in your prayer life, uh, meet us there uh, on the second and fourth Saturday. So this Saturday coming, we will be uh, in the prayer power hour. And it's usually, I mean, right on point to end at 9 o'clock. Uh, well, I say 9, but 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern. But we start at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. And so come, come in and just, just have your have your spirit charged so that you can live a life of victory. So I'm going to balance our teaching tonight with something that I believe many of us need to be aware of. You know, and as I talked about having knowledge of your surroundings and having discernment, you know, when, you're, when you are a believer, that's part of your, your, your package. You come with a discerning spirit. But when you don't know the things of the Spirit and you can't discern what's happening around you, it makes it really difficult for you to know how to maneuver, act, or behave because you don't discern the things that are happening and the things that are spiritual. And many times when there are spiritual things around us, but we're treating them as natural things, that's when we get ourselves in trouble because we're looking at things from 
from the natural, from what it appears by the natural eye. But in actuality, sometimes things really that you see are not really what it is. Sometimes they're totally different from what you really, from what you are seeing. And I know that sounds pretty strange, but I promise you, not everything that you're looking at, even though it might look simplified and it may look normal, not everything is simplified and not everything is normal. Some things are happening behind the scenes that's making that thing look one way, but in actuality has something else behind it. So tonight I'm balancing the teachings that we have been doing uh, with a little bit of encouragement uh, as well so that you and I will be prepared. Now, my son used to have this thing that he would say to my sister, and he was younger, of course. He was a little boy, so it was so cute to hear him say this, but he would tell her sometimes when she would try to pray, and, and when I say try to pray, she would just be aggravating him because um, Isaiah was one that was very, I don't know, he, he had a very, he had a seriousness about God as a young, as a young man, a, a, a young baby. And so he told, he would tell, he would, okay, so he called her T-Name. So he would say, Tinan, Tinan, you don't have no power. Tinan, you don't have no power. And so we, it was a running joke with us about not having power. And, and, and the power he was talking about, like, in prayer. And so he, <laughs> she would talk about how she had power because she prayed this and prayed that for him. He's like, Tinan, you don't have no power. But in the, in, the, in the essence of our playing, it's really true that many believers are lacking power. And the thing that made me realize that many times we don't realize that power has been made available to us as believers, as disciples. See, I'm not saying the word Christian because Christian was used one time in the Bible, and it was used as a derogatory uh, title. It wasn't used for anything good. It was trying to demean the followers of Christ. But when you are a disciple, when you are a believer, there's something about you that differs from everyone around you. And there's nothing wrong with being different. See, different isn't bad. It's when everybody wants to be in the same boat, the same cup, the same this or that. That's when things become a little sticky. Because God made us all different. God made us all unique. Don't you know on your hands you have five different fingers and a thumb and with fingers, so five total, but you have different fingerprints. And God made your fingerprints different from my fingerprints. And everybody has a fingerprint that is unique to them. My fingerprint is so unique that my new cell phone, my cellular device, has a feature where I can open it with a with my fingerprint. Don't you know if my fingerprint was common, that would not be the safest way to protect my device? Because everyone and everyone could come and put their finger on the fingerprint uh, um, tool and open up all of your important information. That's how God made you and I. So when we talk about being different, it's not a bad thing. And in being different, I want you to know how different you really are. Now, there are some qualifications about what I'm about to teach, but I'm sure everybody knows that there, there should be an understanding that in order to, be, to start anything with God, you have to first belong to him. You have to first have given that Romans 10, 9 and 10 relationship. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that he has been raised from the dead, it says we shall be saved. So I want to speak to the fact that my son would tell my, my sister, T. Nanny, you don't have no power. I want you all to know that power has been made available. So I want you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. I want to start there in the book of Acts, the first chapter, and I want you to see what Jesus said to his disciples. That's why I'm saying there has to be a qualifying uh, point in our lives 
where we are becoming disciples of God and where we are allowing ourselves to grow and to go to the next level and not allow life to keep us in one place. So in the book of Acts, chapter 1, let's look at verse Bible-toting, scripture-quoting 
uh, fanatic, but by living your life in such a way that if somebody looks like or if you discern that there is someone in need of a kind word or a, a smile or a handshake or a hug, you're there to minister to that person, to serve. That's all minister means is to serve them. How many of you are being witnesses? How many of you, your lifestyle witness that you are a disciple? How many of you, your, your conversation witness that you are a disciple? How many of you, your secret, your private life, the life that nobody sees, the life that nobody knows? You know, some of us can be living double lives. We're, we're, we are a saint on Sunday and, and part of Wednesday or Thursday or whenever. But all the rest of the days, we undercover. Nobody would know or recognize that we belong to him because we're looking like the world. There is something that is said about a believer that has no power. That literally will always bring bondage. Hear me. Without power, there will be no breakthrough, no deliverance, because power is the only thing that the devil will respect. So Jesus says when, when you, he says you are going to receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He says, and when you receive this power, it's going to give you the ability, the strength, the knowing to be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. Those three places represent a, a certain order of how we should be witnesses. Jerusalem represents home, home base. Your family should know that you're different. Your family should know that you love the Lord. Your family should know that there's something about you that maybe, just maybe, you must be for real because there's a change that's a notable change. See, when folks start looking at you and saying, mm, well, yeah, you used to be that, but now I see this. Or I, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't feel like you have to run and hide because guess what? The operative word is, or I should say, the operative words are used to be. It's okay that I used to be, if you know, I always use a harlot or whatever, outlandish things because I'm not trying to touch anybody in particular. I'm just speaking overall. But you know what you used to be. And as long as you used to be that, oh, you're in good company. Because that's all Jesus used is used to be. Oh. <laughs> that's not good English, but it's certainly powerful theology. That, that's all he used. He uses used to be. Check out his word. David used to be a womanizer. But he used him. We got Saul. Saul used to be, well, before he became a king, he was really nothing. But then when he became a king, he was a liar and he was uh, fearful of the people. But God used Saul, although Saul was poor and from a small tribe. You know, God used to be, uh, uh, Rahab used to be, she was really the whore, the whore, the whore. She was really that. But, but she, she's now in the genealogy of Jesus. So it's okay to be a used to be. All I tell people all the time, listen, don't be ashamed and hold your head down because you were a used to be. Just make sure that what you used to be is not in your today. That's when it becomes an issue. Don't say, well, don't bring up my past because this, that, and the other, when you are bringing your past with you. When your past is brought up and somebody is trying to catch you at a wrong time to tear you down, you got to remember that used to be. But when you have your used to be in your today, then you just need to slip on back, go back into your prayer closet, and let the Lord know, Father, I'm in, in this area that you delivered me in. I'm going backwards, and I need you to bring this back, you know, to take this out of me and bring me back to a place of power. So Jerusalem is home. Judea is a little further from home, and then Samaria is all throughout. So we have to recognize that we've got to be witness, first of all, to the people close upon us. If, if, if people don't believe your witness, I mean your siblings, your parents, your, 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 your husband, your wife, your children, if they don't see your, you know, your cousins, your aunts, your aunts, your uncles, and what have you, your friends, your buddies, if these people don't see where God has done a notable change in you, they're not listening. They're not going to take anything like that. They're going to look at you and say, get out of here. That's not real. Get out of here. We don't believe that. Or get out of here. We know, we know who you are.
turned off or what have you. So we've got to be able to distinguish for ourselves and be self-aware where we are as it relates to our our walk. So I'm getting somewhere here because now it says, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That, I mean, just go all throughout. Just go, Samaria was the place where people were actually estranged from from God. They, they were not godly people. You know, they, they were not saved. They, were, they, they didn't know the Lord in a, in a sense. So that's who we have to witness to, the ones who think they know God, the ones who know God, and then the ones who have no concern about knowing him. But I just want to ask you a question. Do you really want power? Do you really want to be a witness? Do you really want to impact the lives of other people? Are you really wanting someone to go to heaven because you ministered to them? I was talking to my brother the other night, and I was sharing with him one of our family members who's a cousin. I won't mention her name, but I remember leading her to Christ many years ago. I remember us walking in the neighborhood, just taking a walk. She was going through some things, and I don't know, we just had a conversation. And before I knew it, I was leading her to Christ. And to this day, she's serving the Lord. To this day, she loves the Lord. So she is uh, one of the persons. I mean, they, they, I have I have led many people to Christ, but she's one of the persons that I would that I would say, you know, when when we all get to heaven and it's all said and done down here, I I I, I you know, she got there because of what the Lord did for me. Do you have anybody that you can really think of that you have witnessed? and that you have lived a life before them that would even want them to know the Lord, that would even cause them to want to serve God, that's where I want us to get to. Get to the fact that your life has purpose, and you, God wants to use you to make a difference. So he's now instructed his apostles, his disciples, that they were going to wait, and they were going to get strength, power, rather, after the Holy Spirit has come. And once the Holy Spirit comes, then there would be a witness. So now, let's walk it out and see where it leads us. Because if you really want power, it's available. And the power that God wants to give us is the power that's going to cause the enemy to get up off your back. That's going to cause the enemy to get up out of your house, your family, your marriage, your mind, your money out of your business, out of your investments, out of your dreams, your visions, your goals. Turn with me now to the book of Luke, chapter 10. I want to equate the power that he's talking about with that scripture. So Luke, chapter 10, tell somebody, I've got to get power. My life has to change. I have to have the power of God evident in my life. I have to be able to walk in another level of authority. So Luke chapter 10 gives it to us really plainly. Here again, Jesus is showing us what he has done for us. So in Luke chapter 10, let's look at verse 19, well, verse 18. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, this is Jesus speaking. For all who don't think Satan is real, for all who don't think that there is truly warfare and that we need to fight a good fight of faith, you are hearing me read from Luke chapter 10, verse 18, where Jesus himself is saying to his disciples, because they were so ecstatic, that the, that the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. And Jesus was saying to them, listen, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So don't you be ecstatic about the fact that demons are subject to you in my name. I want you to know I've given you that authority and that power. Look at verse 19. He says, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Now, okay, that could be literal, but it's not necessarily literal. Serpents and scorpions. 
scorpions are the very evil devices of the enemy that he maneuvers and put together to try to defeat the people of light. So he goes into his dark kingdom. He has those who, who pay homage and allegiance to him. And he tries to maneuver and do things through evil manipulation of people's minds, bewitching them, using the witchcraft to, to get into their lives and to, to destroy their families. So many marriages and families have been torn apart because of this thing which, called witchcraft and, and serpents and scorpions in the kingdom of darkness. That's not God's plan for these families to go through this. That is the force, the opposition. But see, when you have no power, you can't stand against those things because you don't have what it takes. That's why Jesus is telling them here. Look at verse 18 again, verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all, somebody say all, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So Jesus is giving us a promise while he's given us authority. But I want you to see something else. Now, I can break it down and tell you that the word authority and the word power is exousia, and the other word, um, let's see, uh, exousia power and dunamis power. But th th I don't want to do that right now. I I'll save that for another time. I want to show you the necessity of having power and why it's so significant for us to make sure that our lives are ready to receive that power because it makes a difference, not in just your life, but in everyone who is connected to you. I want you to turn with me to, a, we're gonna, we may come back to Luke 10, 19, but I want to turn to a different uh, scripture, Matthew, I want to go to Matthew, and I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter... 10, Matthew 10, because here again, I'm setting it up for you to see that it's Jesus' idea about his disciples having power. It's not my idea. It's not something that I'm trying to promote. It's not something that someone else wants to do to get their own uh, thing done in the earth realm. It's time for you. You are the one that can have this power working in your life. And instead of you needing prayer, you can be the one giving it out. And you can be the one standing in the gap. You can be the one living a, a, a life so strong that you can pull others out of the very hands of the devil. See, that, that's something that you got to desire. you got to desire to be different. you got to desire to be used by God. And he will use you. Matthew 10. Let's look at verse 1. This is what Jesus did. Now, hear, hear, hear the word of the Lord. And when he had called his 12 disciples, hear this, to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, that should be encouraging to us. Because Jesus is equipping his disciples back then. And we know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he gave his disciples power back then over unclean spirits and all power to cast out devils and to heal all kinds of sickness and diseases, then guess what? He's still doing the same thing today. Oh, yes, he is. It's no doubt in my mind. But we have to know that as believers and as disciples, we have this, you know, made of, this is made available to us. We have this in our arsenal. We have the ability to make a difference. Somebody in your family is sick. Somebody in your family is diseased, troubled. Somebody in your family is going through. 
and you know that there is something about the situation that just isn't right, and you have a desire to do more, but you feel helpless because you don't have the power, you don't have the understanding of the things of the spirit, so you just step, you sit around and twiddle your thumbs and say, oh, well, that's just how life is. Stop it. That's not how life is. That's how life is because we are not wanting to put a demand on it to change. But I come to tell us tonight that we can put a demand on things. Don't you see what Jesus said, what, what they said about Jesus in chapter 10 of, my, of the book of Matthew? And I hope when you come to Bible study that you have your Bible with you. And if you don't have an actual physical Bible, that you use your computer or your phone. But I want you to at least see the word. At least see, and if you can't see it, then of course hearing it as well is, is good too. So Matthew 10, it says, and when he had called his 12 disciples, this is Jesus, to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. Do you know unclean spirits are still in our midst? And our lives and some unclean spirits are even in us. And we have got to get to a point where we don't want anything that's unclean living in us. Because why? Those unclean spirits are coming to take over people's lives. That's why when they met the demoniac, which was the man with the, all, all the different legions in, in his body, when they met him, he was out of his mind. And the reason he was out of his mind, because he was possessed with thousands of devils and demons. And it's possible for people's lives to have that much of uh, evil and darkness in it. And many of us, some of us tonight, you may have legions. I may have legions. I don't, I don't want to say we should have that, but I'm saying it's a possibility. So we've got to get to a place where we want to say we don't want none of him in us. But the only way we can actually deal with that and change that is by knowing the power that we have and guess what? Walking in that. So let me continue reading. He said, now, oh no, I'm not going to read all the names of those disciples. Then he said here, in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, see, Jesus will not just give you power to do nothing with it. He wants you to have power because he wants you to be impactful. He wants you to impact other people. He wants you to make a difference in other people's lives so that you will be a witness for him in the earth realm. That's what he means when he says in Acts 1 and 8. So he says in verse 5, he says, these 12 Jesus sent, out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to what? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus was saying, I need you to go to the people that God chose to be God too. And he says, I need you to go to the house of Israel. Don't worry about the Gentiles, which are we. We are Gentiles. Don't worry about the Samaritans. He said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the leper. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely. Give. Do you see that? Do you see how powerful that is? That let me see, I'll the phone. Do you see how powerful that is? That Jesus is telling them, I have given you power. I have given you power. And because I've given you this power, I want you to go now and be impactful. And I want you to go and preach the gospel, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is the kingdom of heaven being at hand? The power to cast out devils, the power to heal the sick, the power to raise the dead, the power to um, cleanse the lepers. God, Jesus is saying, I need you to go out and demonstrate who I am in the earth realm to every person you come in contact with. Because as you do this, you will be my witnesses, and therefore people will come to me and will
will believe on me. How many of you have raised the dead? How many of you have cast out a devil? Ever? How many of you have laid hands on somebody and they were sick and they, and, 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 and they recovered? How many of you have literally led somebody to Christ with leading them in the sinner's prayer? I'm asking those questions tonight not for you to answer me, but for you to answer yourself. For you to think about what, what impact have I made in the body of Christ? Or am I just a person who goes to a building on a Sunday, may call in on the line on a Wednesday, may do something else on a Saturday, may do something on a Monday or a Friday or a Thursday, whatever. But I'm really not doing anything significant because if I do have power, I'm saving it just for me in my, in my, in my four and no more. And if I don't have power, I'm just being religious and I'm just going through the motions because I'm not really showing anybody anything. I'm just living my life and being an okay person. That's not all you're supposed to be. You are supposed to use the power that Jesus has made available to change the lives of, lives of people that you come in contact with. Start in your home, and then you go to Judea, and then you go to Samaria. Then you go to your job. You go to the grocery store, the airport, your neighborhood. You go wherever there, there is a, a soul that may be looking for somebody to help them. So Jesus says in verse 1, it says, he called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them power. Don't you know he wants you to have the same power? He wants you to be able to make a difference in the lives of people that you come in contact with. He doesn't want you to just give them a nice smile or $5 or a ride. No, he wants you to change their lives and save their souls and take them out of the pit of hell and bring them into the kingdom with you. It's not enough for us just to go to church. It's not enough for us just to read our Bible. It's not enough for us just to pray. It's not enough for us just to do it for ourselves and say, oh, well, I've, I've met my quota. No, God has made you a warrior. And that's why we have to rise up and be what he's made us to be. Now, I want to show you something. I want to compare with, with what we saw in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, with an actual account that many of us believe in. I don't know. I can't say all. I'll just say many. But I know many of us believe in this account. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1, because you're going to see that some words that are the same in what we just read in Acts chapter 1, and what we're going to read in Luke chapter 1. All right? So turn there. Turn, get your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 1. How many of you want power? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your right hand if you really want the power. And say, Lord, have mercy on me. I need your power. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, have mercy on me. I need your power. How many of you really want to make a difference? How many of you really want to lead somebody to Christ and heal the sick and raise the dead and lay hands? I remember, this brings me back. I'm telling you, people of God, I used to be so radical, and I still am in a sense. I'm not making apologies, and I'm not making any excuses. I love the Lord, and that's just the bottom line to it. Haven't done it all right, but I thank God that he is faithful and he's forgiving. But I went to the hospital one time, and I see this lady in my mind so clearly. That's why I'm talking about it, because it just came up when I said about going and praying for other people. Um, this lady was a family friend on, in a neighborhood in, in New Orleans on St. Anthony Street. And she had taken sick just all of a sudden. She was an older lady. And see, sometimes because of people's age, sometimes when we have a person who is older, we tend to think, oh, well, it's their time anyway, so we don't have to worry about praying. No, we can't ever decide when it's somebody's time because that's not our place. God has never given us that place to determine when it's time for somebody to leave this earth. So we need to pray until until we can't make a difference. And even after it, it, it changes in the spirit realm where they may pass, if you still want to be a warrior and pray, I saw where he just said in, in Matthew 10 that he gave his disciples power to raise the dead. There have been people that walk this earth that have literally experienced the dead being raised. And it's a possibility for you and I to do it. 
me stop saying that. Jesus was powerful. Jesus went to the grave. He was like, just show me where you laid him. Jesus said, it doesn't matter where he is. He could be in a mortuary. He could be six feet under in the dirt, in the dust of the earth, the ground of the earth. He could be wherever. He said, show me where you laid him in this tomb and this cave. He said, I'm about to bust the moon, and I'm about to get Lazarus up out of there, stinking it all. So Jesus did it. And my point in saying that is because if Jesus did something, then you and I have a right to replicate that, to duplicate that, to imitate that. So we're not doing anything wrong if we desire to raise the dead because why? Raising the dead is what we need to do if that's what the Lord gives us to do as a, as, as a chore, as, a, as, a, as a, um, a, a, a situation. So let's look at it now. Let's look at it. It says here in verse, 34. Let's look at verse 34. Luke chapter 1 and verse 34. Look what it says. Now, we know this is the account. I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, this is the account of the young girl, Mary, who was being visited by the angel because she was about to get uh, a, a baby in her womb by the power of God. Okay? So look what it says in verse 34. Then Mary said, well, let me go a little bit further. Let me go a little bit further. All right, verse 30. Verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, Mary was a teenage girl right here. She wasn't, you know, she was a teenage girl. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? Now, Mary was concerned because Mary wasn't loose. Mary didn't have several partners. Mary was not saying, well, angel, which one should I use to bring the, 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 the God child to no. <laughs> That's not funny. So that's how today it would be. If, if, if that has to be done again, I know it doesn't, but I'm just saying, and the angel would come to a, a young lady, Many of our young ladies think that it's popular and, it, and it's a thing to do to have multiple partners and to test drive before you marry and all that foolishness that the world is. See, that's what I mean when I said earlier, we are taking the world's lead and we are letting people tell us, wait 90 days. We're letting people tell us, well, just get a condom. We're letting people tell us, well, it's okay because guess what? You don't want to marry this one or that one, and they can't satisfy you or can't please you. You don't know how they are. You may not enjoy. See, when you listen to that type of stuff, it starts making sense when you don't have truth to destroy that lie. But see, when you have truth, and God says in his word, flee fornication, when some devil steps to you and tells you that you need to test drive, you can rebuke the devil and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because it is written, I am to flee fornication. Why? Because that's what God said. But see, Steve Harvey, yes, I'm saying it. It doesn't matter. I don't care if these people hear this at, at, at no time and be upset. Because the truth is the truth. And I'm going to let God be the truth and every man a liar. And the truth is we are not to test drive. We are not to try to determine if somebody can sexually satisfy us before we get married. What we should be doing is keeping ourselves for that right one so that when that time comes, you and that right one will have such a wonderful experience, you'll be 
if you done messed up and got the wrong partner, you better have a prayer life. Because sometimes you're not safe even then if they are people who are wanderers. Let's just tell the truth. But the point I'm making is Mary was concerned about what the angel had told her because she says, how can this be when I don't know a man? She didn't say, I don't know, like, I don't have a knowledge of one because you know Joseph was there. What she was saying was, I'm not intimate. There is no person I've had sexual relations with. So how can I have a child? See, Mary was thinking about it, what, in the natural but the angel answers her, and this is what I want you to see. We're about to close. This is what I want you to see in verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy what Spirit will come upon you. Didn't you see those words in Acts 1 and 8? Look what it says. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, i got to work here for just a little bit, and then I'm going to, you know, uh, give us a benediction, and we're going to go on. Verse 35 is the unique word of Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8 is not talking about anyone receiving a child. But Luke 135 is telling us, that the only way Mary was going to receive this precious Holy One was going to be by the Holy Spirit coming up on her. What I want you to understand is the only way your life and my life will make a difference is if we have the power that causes the impossible to be possible. Are you understanding me tonight? You and I, we have to, you, we've got to be at a place where we want power. Because in wanting power, we've got to want the, the, the very thing that's going to make our lives different. And when we get the power, the thing that was impossible for Mary to accomplish because she wasn't sexually active is the thing that Mary could accomplish. Why? Because she had the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon her life. Somebody need to lift up your hand and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, overshadow my life. In the name of Jesus. Why? Because you know, you're not trying to get a baby. But what you want to be able to do is make, make, the, make the connection. You want to be able to make those impossible situations in your life possible. And the way that's made possible is by the Holy Spirit coming upon our lives. I'm telling you, I, I gave us a prayer the day of um, the, the new day, not the new day. Uh, and, and watch night, watch night service, crossover service, crossover service, not watch night, crossover service. And I said to us, from that point till now, we should be anointing ourselves and saying, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Power of the Most High, overshadow me. And I've been giving that to us on Saturdays as well. And so that's the same scenario. That's the same context. When we anoint ourselves and say, Holy Spirit, come upon me. Power of the Most High. Overshadow me. The Holy Spirit, I mean, the angel told Mary that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her and the power of the highest will overshadow her. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, do you know if the Holy Spirit can come upon a young virgin girl and impregnate her with the power and the Son of God, don't you know that same power can come in your life and in my life, and we can take authority over the things that's trying to take authority over us and shut those things out of our minds, our bodies, our spirits, our homes, our families, our finances, our destinies, our callings. Don't you know there's more to you than what meets the eye? 
granddaughter she went to the hospital again she had a virus so I'm looking for prayers to help her out okay which one Sean okay sure Sean okay if she has a virus okay we, we will do that before we get off the line anyone else have a prayer request who would like to pray for Sean who would like to after hearing what we just heard after receiving um, this word of power. Who would like to pray for Charm tonight? You can pray for us, Father. Huh? You can pray for her. 